Well, I'd like to introduce you to the Digilent PMOD compass board based on a three-axis compass from Honeywell. We'll take a look at some compassing principles and corrections, take a look at a detailed configuration example, and then also reading compass data. This is the Digilent PMOD compass board that's included in the NI MyRio Mechatronics kit. This part is based on the Honeywell HMC 5883L three-axis digital compass located right there in the upper right corner. Applications for a compass like this include navigation because it senses the Earth's magnetic field. You can use that for traditional compassing and finding a bearing. You can also treat it as a magnetometer that can be used for ma magnetic field mapping. Reviewing the features of the Honeywell part, we have a three-axis device, X, Y, and Z, 12-bit resolution, selectable ranges going all the way from plus minus 0.88 Gauss up to 8 Gauss. Note that the Earth's field is about 0.3 to 0.7 Gauss, so this is a very sensitive device. Selectable data rates anywhere from 0.75 Hz up to 75 Hz, and even 160 Hz with special treatment. This compass communicates using the I2C serial bus at device address hexadecimal 1E using either standard or fast modes. It includes a data ready output pin and is powered between 2.16 and 3.6 volts. Let's take a look at the pins for the PMOD compass board. In this zone, we have the power and I2C bus pins. Should note that the pin pairs are actually joined together. Up here we have the pull-up enables for the serial data and serial clock. Leave these disconnected though if you're using MyRio because MyRio already has these pull-ups built in. Here we have the data ready line. This is an open drain style output that is active low and the PMOD compass board includes a pull-up resistor that pulls that signal to be normally high. Let's take a look at the compass on the PMOD compass board. As laid out, we have pin 1 located right here. Let me zoom in a bit. And according to the data sheet, with this orientation, we have the plus axis going this way, plus Y axis going like that. Coordinate system follows the right hand rule. That means that the plus Z axis is pointing out the top of the board. You get a positive value when the plus axis direction matches the magnetic field direction. Well, let's review some basic compassing principles. Here's the Earth's magnetic field. We have the North and the South Pole. The magnetic fields are associated with the Earth's core. They emanate from the South Pole and terminate back at the North Pole. Here we have the true North. That's based on the axis of rotation of the Earth. Magnetic north is a little bit different, and the difference between those two is called the declination angle. This is the position of magnetic north compared to true north, and it does vary with your position or location on the Earth. Here I'm looking at a web page from the National Geophysical Data Center, and looking at a map of the U.S., we see there is a single line right here where both magnetic north and true north end up being exactly the same thing. But away from that, we find that the magnetic north is either west or east of true north. There's also a world map that you can find on that page. Let me try finding out the specific value for the location in Austin, Texas. And this says that we have just over 4 degrees. And that means, again, that this is a difference of 4 degrees between magnetic north and true north. Also note that the magnetic field lines are only 90 degrees at the poles, and then it would be some lower angle elsewhere. This inclination angle is on the order of 70 degrees in North America. You can also find this from the Geophysical Data Center webpage as well. Again, let me try that out with the same location down there in Austin, Texas. 
and it says that the inclination angle is 59 degrees. And this inclination angle tells us that the field lines are mostly pointing into or out of the ground. Into the ground if you're in the northern hemisphere, out of the ground in the southern hemisphere. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this inclination angle. When the sensor is normal to the field, then we find that the z-axis reaches its maximum value because it's perfectly lined up with that field line. Also, the value would be negative, so we would say that it's really the maximum absolute value that we're talking about. Both x and y would be zero for this case. Now, when the sensor is parallel to the ground, then we see that we still have a fairly large negative value for z, but we start to see some non-zero components showing up for both x and y. So in general, these would be non-zero values. However, the y-axis, when it assumes zero, that tells us that x is at a relative maximum value, and that also then indicates that the compass x-axis points toward magnetic north. Now in terms of compass bearing in general, we form a vector of the x and y measurements and then express those in polar form to get the angle. It is possible to apply tilt compensation if you know the sensor orientation, but that's a little bit more difficult procedure. Now when you rotate the sensor 360 degrees, I'm using a little camera tripod here to do that, what you'll find is that when the sensor is level with the ground, we expect X and Y to trace out sinusoidal paths. I'll show you what I mean here. I'm turning it by hand. We see X starting to increase. Now it's starting to decrease while Y continues to increase. I'll take a pause here to get my hand on the other side of the tripod. Keep turning. And at this point, I'm pausing at a full rotation of 360 degrees. I'll try sending it back the other direction. I'm going to have to take a quick pause while I change hand position. And now I'm back to the original location of zero degrees. So I'm back at my original orientation. Now as we look at what happened there, we see that there's a relatively large negative z-axis value. The fact that it's kind of wobbling means that my sensor wasn't perfectly level. We also see that it's roughly like sine wave curves, but they are not centered about zero. To properly calibrate the compass then, we need to determine the max and min values of those sine wave curves. Find the average value, which would be the max plus the minimum value divided by two and then subtract that from subsequent measurements, both in the x and the y direction. You do the subtraction before computing the angle. For a full correction then, you'd want to add the declination angle. If we have degrees east, that tells us we add the value. Degrees west means you would add a negative angle. So west means negative. All right, now that we have some of these compassing principles in mind, let's take a look at a specific configuration example for the Honeywell 3-axis compass. I'll focus on a subset of the 12 available registers and ask that you see the data sheet for complete details. I have the URL for the compass product here. Please select the brochure link at the bottom of the page. I'd also like to point out that this device supports auto-indexing. That means you write the address of a desired register and then subsequent reads or writes on the same bus transaction automatically access the next register. Now the Honeywell part has three registers, configuration registers A and B, and then a mode register. Here I'm indicating the hexadecimal address and then also showing the bit fields for each one of these registers. This bit field is, is associated with averaging. You can average one, two, four, or eight samples per output. These three bits indicate the data output rate, ranging from 0.75 Hz up to 75 Hz. These two bits, called the measurement configuration, are associated with either self-test or normal operation. 
the gray bit there needs to be zero at all times. And here's a specific example of 15 hertz averaging only one sample per measurement and using normal mode. Therefore, we need to write hexadecimal one zero to address zero. Let's look at configuration register B. This is where we can take care of the range setting. We can specify a gain of 1370 least significant bits per Gauss down to 230. You want to divide the output that you read directly from the compass by this gain in order to obtain the units in Gauss. You want to use the highest sensitivity for compassing. So I'll go ahead and use the gain of 000 for that bit field. The mode register, last two bits here are called the mode select. You have either continuous measurement mode, single measurement, or idle. If you're using continuous, you want to pull the data ready output. Single measurement mode means that you can get a single value out, but then the device returns back to an idle state. I'll go ahead and use the continuous mode and also leave the high speed I2C mode disabled. And so I have this value of zero that I write to address two. Let's take a look at polling the data ready output. In order to read the compass output measurements, we poll data ready, we wait for it to drop low. Once you detect that condition, you write the address of the data output X most significant byte register, which is address three, read six bytes in the same bus transaction. And you will get them in the order of the most significant byte, that is the high byte, least significant byte, low byte for X, and then for Z axis, it's important to recognize that it's not an order of X, Y, and Z, and then Y comes last. Join the most significant byte and the least significant byte together into a 16-bit signed integer, and then apply the corrections that I described earlier. When you do this, zero degrees points to true north. Also remember to look up your declination angle. That changes depending on your location on the planet.